Hi, uh, my name is Raghu. I'm the founder and CEO of Data Coral. Uh, uh, this is a startup based out of San Francisco where we offer end to end data infrastructure as a service. I'll talk a little bit about the company, but most uh, towards the end, but mostly uh, going to talk about uh, some of the questions that we've been trying to answer uh, based on some of my own learnings as I've worked in data infrastructure for a while. A little bit about myself. So, um, so I used to work at uh, internet companies like Yahoo and Facebook. And specifically at Facebook, during its kind of uh, explosive growth years, uh, had to deal with a lot of the problems around scaling infrastructure. Uh, how do you make sure that you actually support hundreds of customers by providing like a shared uh, uh, infrastructure? And along the way, also solved some of the problems that uh, Facebook had around trying to anonymize data, trying to uh, make sure that people inside of Facebook itself uh, we could kind of cordon off different kinds of data to different people. I'll talk a little bit more about all of those. In terms of this talk itself, there's kind of two uh, stories as such that I'd like to talk about. And for each one of them, just give you a sense for what exactly happened. This is, again, over five years ago now, so chances are that a lot of things have changed, at least in that large company, I guess, Facebook, but then turns out a lot of those learnings are still applicable right now, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And there's a couple of assumptions that I'm making uh, when I talk about how you might apply some of those learnings here. One is that everybody's actually moving to the cloud. I know actually uh, in the conference itself, I talked to a few people who are like, yeah, there's no way we're going to move to the cloud, but for those, maybe, for those sets of people, maybe that's kind of a harder uh, uh, thing to kind of have to build out a bunch of stuff themselves. And then the second uh, thing is that, yes, people are in the cloud, but then clouds don't offer everything, and they don't want to spend a bunch of time building everything themselves. So they will look to vendors to solve a bunch of their data infrastructure needs. Then the question becomes, what should you expect off of these vendors? Uh, and what has been happening right now, and where do we believe that uh, the world is moving. The first story is uh, mainly about providing a shared service as we kind of scaled fairly dramatically at Facebook. Uh, back in 2008, we had a fairly small kind of nascent Hadoop cluster, uh, which is about 50 terabytes. And over a period of about five years, Facebook itself grew fairly dramatically. It grew about like 12x. But then along the way, as you can imagine, if there are more people on the platform, on, on the product, being more engaged, and then inside of Facebook itself, there were more people trying to leverage data to build better product or understand user behavior better. So data infrastructure as such, actually, the load on it would grow kind of orders of magnitude more than that. And around 2011, we got to a point where we couldn't build a data center big enough to hold all the data. We kept moving to bigger and bigger clusters. But then after a point, we were like, yeah, there's no bigger cluster that uh, we could actually build out. So as part of the project that actually uh, carved out parts of this giant cluster and moved compute, storage, and the data all into like different data centers while kind of providing, uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it 24-7 uh, operations, but there was very, very little downtime as we did all of that. And the key part about kind of the, the clouds that you see kind of here is that we ended up having to build a multi-tenant model, right? Uh, so we had like one giant cluster, everybody was kind of uh, pounding it. But then we realized that that was just not really scalable. And when you think about what it means to be multi-tenant, you might have a bunch of clusters, like a handful of clusters sitting in different data centers. So when we thought about uh, tenants, these were different teams inside of Facebook. Right? So you'd have the ads team, the newsfeed team, photos team, uh, the growth team, and so on. And our goal became to make each of these teams become tenants for our shared service. But then when you think about what multi-tenant means, you're assigning tenants to these clusters. Right? And as these tenants grow and shrink, or mostly just grow a lot, you're having to do this, uh, solve this 
bin packing problem. So you have a bunch of bins that are of specific sizes depending on what cluster, like how big it is, or how big it can grow. And then you know that there are these kinds of customer, uh, uh, these tenants that are also growing, and then you try to assign them, and as they start growing, you have to move them around. So when you think about, uh, like completely outside of Facebook itself, like when you think about uh, SaaS products that are providing multi-tenant uh, solutions, you realize that they're probably solving the same problem. So they're a shared service, they have hundreds of customers, or like many customers, and they want to be able to provide that as a multi-tenant multi service. So what that means is that they're constantly in their engineering is spending time trying to move customers between clusters or like trying to grow clusters and so on. So the learnings while actually doing all of this is that cluster management is actually fairly hard. Especially, I mean, you saw uh, the previous talk, which was about just airflow, but then if you're uh, it's not just airflow, but there might be databases that you're working with or like queuing systems or whatever else, and each of them are their own sets of clusters. And when you think about one overall setup, you realize that each of these clusters are kind of uh, interacting with each other, and as the amount of load increases on this particular setup, you start realizing that skews start causing these clusters to get into pretty bad states. And once something gets into a pretty bad state, you have to take the time to actually fix it, and then by then, there's a huge workload that is piled up, and then you have to go kind of uh, uh, do the backfill or whatever else that is needed. And this whole notion of uh, shared infrastructure as uh, death by a thousand cuts, it's basically a point where if you have one cluster that you're trying to provide as a service for multiple customers, and they, I mean, they don't know about each other, right? So they just use it the way that they want to, but then if, as a service provider, you're not able to actually handle uh, the, the skews that might happen or the bursts of activity that might happen, then your cluster is always in this kind of state of uh, disrepair, and you're always having to fix it, especially if you're growing dramatically. And the last point is multi-tenancy itself has a bunch of security implications, right? So if you have uh, data from multiple customers going into the same set of clusters, you know that that data is kind of getting commingled. And for a bunch of data, it's kind of okay, but for companies that are trying to use these kinds of services, if they, if they really care about their data privacy, they don't really like the fact that their data is getting commingled with some other company's data. Now the question is, what exactly can you do right now as kind of customers as trying to use uh, these kinds of vendors, especially if you're in the cloud? What are the kinds of things that you would want to expect from vendors to kind of provide you? The question basically is, is multi-tenancy the right kind of model? The question, uh, around this multi-tenancy, if you think about how SaaS product or uh, software as a service itself was built out, the whole notion was of economies of scale. There'd be one company that would provide one uh, piece of functionality, but across multiple customers, but that means that the underlying infrastructure would be shared, and hence it would be cheaper, faster to set up, and so on. But then, when you think about what's happening around serverless computing, you realize that a lot of the shared infrastructure spend or like the economies of scale that you might get by sharing infrastructure, maybe you don't need uh, that sharing of infrastructure anymore. And once you start kind of pulling the thread on what serverless computing is actually able to do for you, maybe you can get to a point where you can have multiple isolated installations where it's kind of fully secure. And of course, the the good news about uh, serverless computing is that there's absolutely no cluster management needed. You don't need to uh, get into a point where these clusters get into bad states and so on. I can go into more detail about kind of what it means for a service to be serverless for the customer versus it being serverless for the vendor as well. The key difference that you might realize is 
Just because it's serverless for the customer does not mean that it's actually serverless for the customer. Uh, uh, serverless for the customer does not mean that it's also serverless for the vendor. So the vendors themselves are doing cluster management and like trying to keep warm nodes and all of that stuff. But then they provide the, uh, the interface for the customer that it's actually serverless. But the key thing that happens with something like this is that the vendors themselves are spending a significant amount of engineering to try to make the service be as seamless as possible. And more often than not, they end up passing that cost on to the customer. So that's kind of the, the overall thought. Then the question is, okay, now, let's say you are working with these vendors. If security is really important for you, what are the kinds of questions that you can ask these vendors? Can you ask them, again, if you're in the cloud, for them to actually be able to run their software inside of your VPC, inside of your network, so that no data actually leaves your systems? You'd use things like VPC peering. Are people familiar with what VPC peering is? Okay, so this is basically a way where you uh, allow for traffic, uh, it, uh, or like data to be moved from one system to another without actually going over the internet. So this is basically a pretty uh, strong uh, uh, security feature that you'd want to expect, especially if you don't want your data to kind of keep flying around around the internet. And if your vendors are able to actually provide something like that, then that means that you're in like pretty good place as far as your own data security is concerned. And in terms of what you can do as you use these kinds of vendors is, and, and especially if these vendors provide fully managed services, they'd want some privileges in your cloud to be able to actually run that software. In those situations, it'll be good if you can actually just cordon off that vendor into its own uh, kind of cloud account so that it doesn't interact with everything else that you're kind of running. And you apply this notion of uh, principle of least, least privilege so that you only offer the roles to these vendors that are absolutely needed to run uh, their software. And as a, uh, as a customer or as the owner of the cloud account, you can enable all the auditing that will allow you to kind of see exactly what's going on in that particular installation that your vendor is providing. So it turns out there are actually a few companies that do some parts of it, right, um, where storage is actually, like, if you're on AWS, uh, they expect storage of your data to be in your S3, and then they can spin up compute inside of your uh, AWS account if that's basically what you want. But not all of them are doing that. And our hope or like our belief is that as people want to kind of take care of their own data and make sure that they have full control over who gets to see that data, they'll start trying to push vendors to provide services that can actually run inside of their own cloud. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'll just move on to the next uh, part of this, which is around data privacy itself. And just kind of introduce it around GDPR. One of the biggest challenges around GDPR, especially for analytic systems, is this notion of uh, the right to be forgotten. So it turns out we had actually worked on this problem of right to be forgotten way before there was GDPR, because there were kind of rumblings even back in like 2011 or so around this. So when you think about what does this actual problem mean, it basically says when a user come, like they're using your product over maybe a few years, let's say, and then one fine day they come in and say, you know what, forget about me. So now imagine all the data that you may have kind of collected as they've used the product, like legitimately collected all of that information. And then all of this information was actually stored inside of your analytics databases because you want to do longitudinal analysis or anything like that. And again, because if, if you're using big data systems, they're typically based off of uh, file-based storage, like HDFS or S3 or whatever else. Then, you get into this problem of a user 
coming and saying, okay, now forget about me. You have to essentially go look through every single piece of data that they may have generated and the derived data that may include something that will tie that derived data back to them, right? So if you think about true compliance as a company, this is basically what you'd have to do, which is not just kind of delete the raw data if a user says, uh, forget about me, but all the analysis that you might have done and kind of kept around because you want to kind of save even maybe some aggregated information or you're trying to capture like, profiles over a period of time or whatever else. And just kind of thinking about uh, this type of problem kind of makes your head hurt, right? So how exactly are you going to keep track of uh, or essentially index at a user level all the data that may have been kind of stored in this analytics uh, database, not just at source data, but a bunch of derived data as well. So clearly at Facebook, we did have to take on that problem. We did what we call proactive anonymization. So this notion of anonymization is kind of, uh, it's a, an attempt at trying to be compliant while still not losing the optionality of data. So a very simple kind of example is, let's say 100 people used your product last year, 100 unique people. And today, five of those users came and said, forget about me. So now tomorrow, if you ask the question, how many users used my product last year, are you going to return the answer 95, or is it going to be 100 because you had to go delete that data? Right? I mean, pretty simple stuff, right? Then you start thinking about, okay, it's not just about unique counts. There may be other things that, are, that don't really tie the information back to the user, but still, uh, or it may tie the information back to the user, but if they say that you need to forget about them, you need a very efficient way of cutting the, uh, the connection, right? And that's the challenge that we took on. The very first thing that we did was, uh, of course, this was like a high warehouse, so there's a bunch of, like hundreds of thousands of tables and, uh, 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 and partition, millions of partitions and so on. And for each of these tables, we'd, uh, we semi-automatically came up with this notion of semantic types. So there would be like an IP address type. It could be named different things in different tables because, well, it's uh, data democratization, right? Like different people call things differently. But then we needed the semantic types to be standardized. And for each of these semantic types, we had defined anonymization functions that would take something like an IP address, but then return back a masked IP. And that's specific to that semantic type, irrespective of which table it uh, uh, had a column with that semantic type. And there were some that were, I mean, you just could not keep any piece of information, you just kind of null it out, like a full name, let's say. And the user ID type, though, was a pretty uh, unique type for us. So we actually, uh, the the thing about Facebook specifically is that the user ID, the number, used to be a publicly available ID. It was in the URLs and things like that. And that same user ID was also in a bunch of data that was captured about that user, the activity, whatever else that uh, uh, they had done. So for this specific case, we came up with a replacement ID for this user ID, which was randomly generated. So the idea was, for a given user ID, if that user ID was in a mapping table, then in that mapping table, there would be a replacement ID for that user ID. Without that entry of user ID replacement ID in a mapping table, there is no way to tie the user ID and the replacement ID. So you might get a sense of where we are going here. The idea was, instead of trying to go and null out user IDs, which would essentially kind of uh, eliminate or uh, uh, get your analysis, like historical analysis, to become uh, incorrect. 
we wanted to replace these user IDs with randomly generated, uniquely mapped replacement IDs, where the mapping itself was actually centralized in one place that could just be uh, uh, worked on, or that could be uh, updated whenever a user said, forget about me. So this goes into a little bit more detail about kind of how this whole thing uh, worked. So this, there was a huge kind of uh, uh, column or data or uh, column level tagging that happened between like column names and semantic types in different tables. And there's a bunch of tables that were identified as having PII or personally identifiable information. And this is all Hive, so you can think of uh, each of these little boxes there as Hive table partitions. And let's say there was, these are all kind of daily table partitions. And the final uh, kind of table there, or the final partition there is for the current day. So one of the things about right to be forgotten was you had, let's say, 30 or 90 days to actually scrub your, all of your systems off of that user data once a request was submitted. So that we treated as kind of the retention line. Right? And then, remember there was this mapping from like types, semantic types to the anonymized uh, values? We would take every single partition of these tables with PII and we'd create an anonymized partition for that same table which was, so if, let's say this was a 30 day retention that you needed, or 30 day kind of window that you had, you'd start doing this anonymization like 27 days, uh, for 27 day old data. So that way you're not, like you're just not duplicating a bunch of data. So the table in the middle is the anonymized version where all the types, the IP addresses have been masked, the user IDs have been replaced by these replacement IDs, and uh, names have been nulled out or whatever else. And remember that this is only done once. So you anonymize a particular partition only once, and once you write it, it's done. Irrespective of how many users say, forget about me, you're not touching that partition again. And then there is this replacement ID table, which is this mapping table, which essentially just corresponds to the users that showed up that day, uh, or all the users that were deemed active on that day, right? So the way to think about it is for you to be able to retrieve back most of the uh, kind of the full data, you can join the anonymized table back to the replacement ID table to get a reasonable version of uh, the data without everything kind of nulled out. So what this did is it allowed us to keep data for much longer. The anonymized data could be kept pretty much forever while still being able to uh, kind of be compliant. And of course, because of these replacement IDs which are unique, a lot of the, like those replacement IDs were stable. As in, for a given user ID, there'd only be one replacement ID across all of time, all right? Once you say, once they say, okay, forget about me, you just remove that mapping and then that's it. There's no way you can tie that back. So this is basically, it took us a while, as you can imagine, we had like tens of petabytes of data to anonymize this way. Uh, but there's a lot of these kinds of learnings where we realized that by just operating at the, so a lot of this mapping and all of that stuff was done by our data scientists. They were the ones who knew the semantics of the data or the, uh, the different uh, types of columns that were there and what the mappings were. And as a data infrastructure team, we ended up providing all the infrastructure that was needed and the scaffolding so that this kind of uh, automation or automatically proactively anonymizing data, that entire flow was handled by us. So the question is what would we do if we had to kind of start all over again, all right? The, Biggest challenge definitely was the fact that we had to separate out PII and non-PII data after the fact. That just, just dealing with history and anybody who has dealt with data enough kind of knows that if there is a bug in an application, you just go fix the application, you push it out, a new version, you're done. With data processing, you're going back and fixing history. And that dramatically increases the complexity of what kind of problem you're your, the kinds of problems that you're solving. 
So this, the second thing is that by actually taking on this task of defining these semantic types, what we realized is that it gave us a bunch of discipline around saying, okay, what is the actual data that's act, that is being kind of captured or like stored in the analytics systems? And we end up, ended up doing, being a lot more conservative in terms of saying, if a table was not tagged as either having PII or not, you just have like a 30-day retention so that you don't even have to worry about it, it'll just get del uh, deleted. So people who cared about their data had to kind of come up with the right tagging and make sure that they could keep the data around. And when you think about what proactive anonymization does, in some sense, you are unnecessarily deleting a bunch of data, right? So a user might have not come and told you, forget about me, but you're anonymizing their data anyway. But that seemed to be like a reasonable compromise while for the scales that we had to stay compliant while still keeping that optionality of data, as, as uh, data scientists call it. So now, now that we are in this kind of uh, post-GDPR world, the question is, what can you do so that you can, again, stay compliant while still save a bunch of your data? The first thing is to try and use tools that make it fairly straightforward for you to actually specify these semantic types. There are some BI tools that uh, we have used in the past, Metabase being one, where you can actually tag uh, uh, columns and tables with uh, uh, kind of some descriptions, and, but then you need to have your own conventions to specify the, uh, the semantic types. Uh, and the second thing that you'd need is a way to kind of separate your PII data from other usage data as close to the source as possible. So don't let a bunch of derived tables end up having PII information unless you absolutely need it. That level of discipline will kind of save you from having to go back and anonymize that data going forward. But then it's actually pretty hard to do it at source. So if you're pulling data from like Salesforce or Zendesk, or any of these kind of applications, turns out there is going to be PII information there. And you do have to join that with like a bunch of other data. So in those cases, you will have to kind of take on this load of trying to actually uh, do the process of anonymization. So we had dealt with uh, Hive at Facebook where this was a file system based storage. So table updates were not very efficient. But nowadays there are databases, I mean Redshift being one, Snowflake being another, where you can actually do row level uh, kind of updates. They'll eventually kind of vacuum the table or whatever and you can, uh, uh, like it will not use up too much space. But if you don't use those kinds of tables, and again, like the, uh, the suggestion here is to not go and delete records, but to actually replace them with anonymized versions of them so that you can kind of keep at least like a skeleton of that data around, even though the user said, forget about us. And in terms of the data privacy itself inside of your uh, company, as in if you want to, uh, to kind of cordon off sensitive data to only certain teams and leave all the other data sets uh, to be available for other, other parts of the company, I mean, databases do provide row level and column level security but then they, it seems like they're way too fine-grained. So it would be incredibly hard for you to kind of manage. It's like managing network ACLs or whatever, right? You, you need to know the implications of all of these rules and how they interact with each other. So there's one complication around kind of role-based, not role-based, but data dependency-based privacy, and I'll get to that. But other than that, if you can organize your, again, sensitive data and uh, uh, non uh, kind of uh, PII kind of data, you can level schema, uh, schema level access controls and make it a lot more kind of easy to manage. The key thing about, uh, I, I told you about data dependency based privacy is that databases themselves don't really do that good of a job. You typically need an application on top. So the way to, uh, kind of think about this problem is, let's say you have a customer success person inside of your company, 
you only want to allow them to do analytics on accounts that they own, right? Not all accounts. Now, you can technically build a schema per customer success person, but that just seems way too kind of complicated. Instead, whatever analytics you end up kind of computing, you would store it in uh, a schema that all customer success people are able to access. But then maybe at the application layer, you automatically add filters so that they only get to see the data that uh, they have a onto objects for which they have a relationship with. So again, like these are kind of, uh, I feel like I uh, gave you like a, uh, a pretty complicated problem that we ended up solving at Facebook and then I'm kind of giving you ideas about how you might be able to deal with uh, not as massive data sets but still fairly strong kind of uh, compliance requirements that you guys have. Hopefully that was uh, useful. I'm again going to uh, kind of switch over and talk about kind of how we have been applying these kinds of learnings and others in the company that we've been building. We launched the company yesterday, actually, so kind of pretty exciting day for us. The overall thing that we do at Data Coral is that we provide a secure and end-to-end -end data infrastructure as a service inside of our customer's uh, cloud. So it's basically, it's your data. It could be sitting anywhere. It is your AWS account, it's your VPC, and we provide these serverless building blocks that are implemented predominantly using AWS Lambda. Uh, I'm guessing people are familiar with Lambda. And we have kind of just uh, pulled the thread on what parts of our data, an end-to-end -end data infrastructure stack can be represented as Lambda functions. So we call, like, we call them functional building blocks or data functions, basically. And there are three kinds of functionality that we believe uh, data infrastructure typically kind of provides. One is collecting data. You, you could be pulling data or like receiving data from a bunch of places. So we have building blocks for that. And once you receive that data, you want to be able to uh, get that data into a database that you can actually then use to transform that data. So we support different query engines. We support Redshift, Athena, uh, Hive, Spark, things like that. And within these databases, and uh, depending on how much time I have, yeah, uh, I can get into a little bit uh, more around what happens in the organized side. But at a very high level, we kind of let you just declare that you need data from different uh, sources and then make all of the data available inside of an analytics engine. And inside of that analytics engine, you can define views and views on top of other views not really build out jobs and tasks, but just declare views in the language that's native to that query engine. And then you can declare that the final view result not just be used in, I mean, you can query it, of course, in like a BI tool or something, but you can also publish the data back into applications. So instead of kind of uh, showing a Tableau dashboard to your salesperson, you're making that exact same information show up in their own Salesforce. So that way they're not having to move between systems. So these are the building blocks that we have uh, kind of built out. And what ends up happening is because of this declarative interface that uh, you've come up with, you can specify an end-to-end -end flow. And once you specify it, the underlying implementation, which is like a bunch of building blocks that are all serverless, they all get deployed inside of your VPC. And you end up getting an end-to-end -end data infrastructure. And we provide kind of 24-7 uh, operations so that you don't really have to worry about how the data is flowing, whether the data uh, is fresh, whether, the, uh, uh, whether there's any problems with the changes in schemas and things like that. And what ends up happening with this is that security is actually built in. So no data is leaving your systems. It's in fact all encrypted using your keys. So what that means is that even though we provide a fully managed service, we don't get to see your data. And we can, not just because we have gone through compliances, in fact, we have uh, gone through maybe a few security audits, but no real compliance, but we can actually prove to you that we don't see, get to see your data, not because we have some processes in place. And that is what we believe kind of most vendors should be doing as well. 
Uh, I'm just going to show one other slide, and that'll be it. Yeah, and this is the kind of the data-centric interface that I was talking about, where you can just declare views, and inside of the database, right? So any database that you choose, and then we look into the system catalog of the database, and given that we know where data is coming from, how it is getting organized through these view definitions, and where it is going, we compute just like how databases compute query plans we compute a data flow plan right and you get full visibility into how the data is flowing how fresh it is we have a micro batch kind of uh, way of uh, doing the processing so you get to see full visibility into kind of the data provenance it's all because as uh, people who are building these transformations you know exactly what data a particular transformation depends on in fact you code it, code that up but then you code them up into these jobs and tasks that then kind of obscure those kinds of data dependencies. And you're having to go through a lot more additional work to get, those, uh, get back the data provenance information that the person who actually defined these transformations already knew about. Right? So our goal has been to make data be front and center, not uh, kind of jobs and tasks. And then provide kind of full visibility into kind of how you can uh, debug data problems. Uh, like, for example, if there are schema changes that you're, you're making an update to a view, we know that there's a bunch of subsequent views or even like a published step that might get affected. We are able to kind of detect that and kind of tell you, okay, you need to actually change these other things as well. And we end up creating this notion of update sets, where there's a one consistent update to this entire graph. Right? So we're not relying on the runtime to fail to make that uh, to make those changes. So you can learn more at uh, our at our website. Uh, if I know how to do this, and yeah, with that I'll end. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Sure. Uh, so as you probably know, uh, GDPR, GDPR has affected the media marketing and ad tech industry the most. Um, have you looked into um, security and anonymizing PII data through Google's Ads Data Hub platform? No, not specifically to the platform, okay. but maybe you and I can chat offline to see if there are specific things that might help. Sure. Uh, okay.